person who really enjoyed this the most was a friend of mine who's uh, actually no longer with us, but he was he was almost retired and they had a small business. His family had a small business. And he really enjoyed the fact that that he now had a solution for how to bring his faith to work. And he was surprised at how easy it was to talk about his faith after he had done something for someone. And then they prompted the discussion by asking a question. Folks, welcome to the Disciple Dilemma. We're thrilled that you join us today for another episode, taking a look at discipleship and how it flows throughout all of our world and our worldviews. And with us today is Mike Henry Sr. We're going to welcome Mike aboard to talk about an organization that he founded from his business background and his spiritual background as a believer. Mike, welcome to the Disciple Dilemma. Thanks for having me, Dennis. This is great. Thank you. This is a treat. So we're thrilled to have you. Mike is a uh, Tulsa resident who I think, if I got it right, hails from Memphis. Is that right, Mike? Yes, I grew up in Memphis. He's got a bride, Vicky. He's got a couple of grown kids, daughter and son. He's got grandkids out there in the marketplace in the universe. And um, if I've got your trajectory right and your rap sheet down correctly, Mike, I think that your world has been largely financial technology, information technology management in the past, like financial transactions, that sort of thing. And that's your turf. Yeah. Well, and I changed careers several times and changed jobs a lot. But yes, I several years were in transaction processing and technology software development in and around financial services. I actually began in the trucking and logistics world and kind of used technology to get out of there and get into a more civilized professions. <laughs> so is that like super entrepreneurship or are you just attention deficit disorder challenge? A little both and an impatient, arrogant kid with some of that too. And just, you know, quitting this job and taking another one. And, uh, and so, but it was the, the technology piece was the saving grace because the technology transferred industries. Wow. And so I, I didn't have a long attention span, but if you could talk software, then you could talk in, you can play in a different industry. So you go all the way back to AS 400 and, uh, um, pre pre mini computer micro computer actually i was familiar with those things i was more of a pc dos guy smaller okay. companies but um but i learned how to talk to technology people because I, I only ever learned what i had to to get to where i could go home at night but um <laughs> but i ended up having a little bit of a knack for talking to technology people and talking to business people and being able to translate between the two that's great well, Folks, you'll recognize the other character on the screen, which is Raymond Monroe. Dr. Raymond Monroe is uh, just a, a wonderful friend, a longtime mentor and discipler for me over the years. And uh, I've, I've tried really hard to avoid all of his advice at my own peril. And I've really been grateful for the advice he has given me at his peril. Raymond, glad to have you back aboard. Oh, glad to be here. Glad to be here as always. Always enjoy looking forward to these conversations and enjoy the, the active conversations we have. Yes. I don't get a chance to have a couple of business guys on this thing very often. So let me just start out. You know, the Fed just jacked us up by three quarters of a point, 75 basis points up. So we're pushing, you know, two and a half percent now on the Fed rates, give or take at the window. And um, we got a CPI index sitting around seven, seven and a half. So that means we're still, you know, Fed rates below that CPI rate. Uh, where, where are you two profits of either joy or doom uh, taking our trajectory over the next next six months with the Fed? Are we going to keep jacking rates or are we going to back off now and head into a recession? I want to defer to Raymond. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> I'm Actually, Mike, I have an idiosyncratic view because I'm in the capital intensive asset rich business. I work with the steel plants that make castings. And so they're small, medium sized enterprises. We used to make class eight truck kinds of parts. And and I Peter Principal out e early. So I've been 40 years working in the same industry, working with two and three generations and on technology as well as economics. And because of that, we've had 40 years of disinvestment in any investment of assets. 
And so most of the wealth we have are numbers on a spreadsheet that's a promise of meager profits in the future from service industry. So I think we're ripe for a significant shift in equity values and um, increased interest rates. So I don't know of any safe harbors. I think my members that make um, capital equipment out of uh, asset rich companies, while they struggle with profitability are gonna be really busy for the next 10 years or so. I think it's gonna be different from and maybe even more challenging than the 1970s. But like I said, that's an idiosyncratic view. Everybody thinks the market's gonna flatten out here and bounce back up to record profits and record valuations. And it's hard for me yeah. to see that. So we've got a stock market that's just like trading beyond anybody's uh, wildest dreams right now, even though it keeps on trying to point like it's gonna go deep bear and uh, and ride that down. But you know, valuations are still crazy. Um, supply chains are pretty choked, so you can't get what you need. People still seem to have a fair amount of cash, but a kind of dwindling sentiment in the marketplace. Where where are you guys uh, putting your grease pencil mark on the wall for the next next six months? Are we going to really fit into a classic type recession, or do you think this is going to be an odd ball given what we know about things? So I I don't. I actually don't think a lot about those things. I'm, uh, I want to, I, I kind of have to go back to the Bible and a lot of these things, all that's way above my pay grade. And, um, <laughs> and I want to trust God with all this. Um, he won't take a lot of credit for getting us into it, but he will be glorified in it. And so I'm excited to see what he does next. I like that answer. Raymond, take us into a kind of a gloomy, despairing view then. <laughs> Oh, I think um, any normal market correction to get you to reasonable valuations means that we lose about half of the value of the stock market. And I think that's probably what really happens. And if you look at it starting in 2009 and before that, we took all the guardrails off, all the things that we used to consider the basic disciplines of maintaining a relatively low debt, um, having control over the mo money supply, uh, we decided that no one should ever lose money on an equity or security. And so we just print more money and give it to them. And so it really, I don't, I think inflation is impossible to tame because you have to take that money out of circulation and it's going to go from those assets. It's going to go from those financial assets into hard assets as people chase houses and cars and other things. So, so I think it's going to be pretty, challenging and we'll have one of those um, adjustments. If you look at the biblical generational thing, when's the last time we had such an event? 1980. <laughs> 40 years later, it's 2022. And I think we're in the same kind of event where people who were young, I grew up in that 1970s where if you could, you bought something now and you borrowed money because interest rates were going up, prices were going up and quality was going down. My kids grew up in an environment where prices were going down, <laughs> quality was getting better, and there was no reason to buy right now other than it was gonna be obsolete because it was changing so fast, I could always afford it. And so we were shocked. One of my grandkids came up to my wife, beautiful Renee, and said that her dad had bought him a, a four-wheeler, one of the battery four-wheelers, he says it really wasn't very expensive, only about a thousand bucks. <laughs> and I still think ten dollars is real money. <laughs> yeah. So I think we're going to have a significant cultural readjustment. But I believe, I, I, I agree with Mike. I think one of the things we're likely to have happen, one of the things you two talked about last time, is we'll move from an institutional view of the church to a community view of the church where we'll be more relational and we'll rediscover our vocations of helping people by cutting their grass and fixing mm -hmm. their cars instead of just meeting them for coffee at Starbucks. Yeah. Well, so maybe that's a good tee off point for us to have a conversation about an organization. Let's just come up with a name, follower of one. Let's think about a guy by the name of Mike Henry Sr., who back in, uh, gosh, 2017, I think it was, Mike, yeah. who started this. And it's about business people who are believers who are out in the marketplace. Tell us your story. What in the world were you thinking? Well, 
Well, uh, actually, um, I became a Christian at age 30, and um, it was on a Saturday. I, I didn't like my job, and we were having trouble in our family, and I had gotten involved in church to try and meet my wife halfway. She wanted me to be more involved in church. My wife was a born-again Christian, but I was a born-in-America Christian. I wasn't Jewish, and I hadn't killed anybody, and I was born in America, so I thought I was a Christian. And um, and so I was trying to work my way into heaven. And my kind of goal in life was to be, you know, the third to last guy to get into heaven. I didn't want to work any harder than I had to. And I felt like last and next to last, we're cutting it a little too close. But third to last, I didn't, if I worked a whole lot harder than that, I, I felt like I wasted my energy. And so our marriage was tense because of that. And at the same time, my job situation was negative. It was challenging. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so the people who hired me to do it couldn't really help. You know, I they just wanted me to do my job. And um, when I became a Christian, it was on a Saturday. And I remember asking God to let me live my faith full time. I wanted to do this all the time. How do I do that? And back then, I thought maybe I needed to get go into ministry. You know, I, I always do air quotes when I do that. Because in the ministry meant, you know, quitting my job and moving to some foreign country and raising support. And, um, and I kept telling God, I was willing to consider that. What do you want me to do? And it seemed like, no, I heard nothing. I didn't get any <laughs> clear view or anything like that. One day, I remember getting this idea. What if Jesus didn't save me to take me out of this job? What if he saved me because I was in it? And, um, and I really started asking him, you know, so I'm the only Christian here, what do I need to do? And um, I found out that our FedEx guy was a, a praying man, and he was praying for one of my coworkers. And we started sharing prayer requests. And for the rest of my career, I spent my life trying to figure out how to integrate my faith into my work more and more. And it always seemed to begin with prayer. Um, God started doing things when that happened. So it's just been kind of 30 years of stumbling through a very complicated career because I have a short attention span. I didn't really know what I wanted. And also because I believe God wanted me to mix it up. And um, as a result, we've now kind of come up with this idea of forming an online community to help Christians in the marketplace live their faith on a daily basis. Yeah, let me let me ask a couple of questions here, Mark. Sure. I really enjoyed yours and Dennis's earlier discussion with each other. But the one thing that was a little disconcerting to me because I've worked in engineering my whole life is everybody talks about being a Christian at workplace, like you got to do christian -y things, like pray for your coworkers and that. And so if I say I'm a brain surgeon and I think I'm healing people and that's a Christian ministry, everybody will shake their head yes. But if I say I'm a plumber and I unplug people's toilets and pump out their septic tanks, they think I'm doing that for an instrumental reason or a transactional reason. Mm -hmm. either, either I'm doing it in order to make money and to provide for my family and support the church, or it's instrumental that gives me credibility in the workplace so I can share my faith. Mm -hmm. And I think we as a church have fundamentally failed because I think we have to be vocational first in every area, Correct. relational in our vocational area so that we build deep friendships and love other people. And only after that, do you have the chance for that confessional moment where you can actually share the gospel with somebody because they trust you. They know you're a good person. So it seems to me really problematic in the church that we think that when somebody mows the grass, they're wasting their time. They should be praying or going to a Bible study. But Correct. if that's true, then God screwed up in the Garden of Eden because he didn't put them in the Cathedral of Eden to sing. That's right. They're out there cutting the grass. That's right. No, I agree wholeheartedly. In fact, Monday, that Monday after I became a believer, I was really kind of frustrated because it seemed like the only thing for me to do was to just stay out of trouble till I could get back around all the other Christians. And so, and so I was stuck. I was going to be safe so that I could just stay out of trouble till I died. And then I got to be a, the benefit of being a Christian. 
Um, I think we we split, we have this sacred secular divide that people talk about, where we have some jobs that are Christian, they're sacred, and some jobs that aren't. But every job is something that is an opportunity for us to serve other people so that right. they might get to know Jesus. That's kind of how I ended up defining ministry was I just want to help everyone I meet move one notch closer to Jesus. And then ministry becomes something I can do with any person that I meet in any situation, not even just in a business environment or a church environment. I can do that as a uh, stay at home mom or as a uh, work from home remote employee, because now I can do things that will help people move closer to Jesus. And yeah. most of those need to be actions, right? Building the trust and serving other people uh -huh. and prompting them. Hopefully, I want to live in such a way that people ask me, why are you doing this? Right. right. And then I, I get I, to tell them about it. I, I think that's right. I mean, one of the, <clears throat> I, I mean, actually doing it just to show the love of Christ to them. And so I should feel real joy in having the opportunity. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the things I tell people is, you know, when your wife wakes you up in the middle of the night to unclog the toilet, it's a rare opportunity to show her love because ordinarily it's too easy to do things. It doesn't cost you anything. So it's really not a sacrifice. But when you got to get up in the middle of the night, unclog a toilet, that's a real sacrifice. But that's a rare opportunity to show love. And so it seems to mm -hmm. me. Uh, one, of, one of the people influential in my life was Philip Carey. You probably don't know him. Teaching company guy does a Luther thing. And he says, uh, the Lutheran view was that we have the love of God in Christ. And so moral perfection is not our goal because Jesus did that for us already. Right. Our goal is to expand the kingdom of God by showing, giving away the love of Christ to everybody with all the resources and assets we mm -hmm. have. That's right. That's right. And some degree, I think anything that we hang on to rots or dies. It's only the stuff that we give away that gets multiplied. It was the yeah, five yeah. loaves and the two fish that were given to Jesus that fed 5,000 people, not whatever other food was in the crowd that day. Well, so, speaking of the crowd, then, let me ask this question. If I'm part of the crowd and I walk up to followerof1.org, it's the mm -hmm. word one, O-N-E, followerof1.org, what are you guys going to tell me? What What's going on under the hood there? Well... <laughs> So we're challenging Christ followers, every Christ follower, to see themselves as a full-time minister. Um, and their job just happens to be the context in which they do that, or their daily situation. And we try to explain that on our landing page, that we have three ways that we approach this. We created a plan, which we call our five daily activities. And we have a practice, which is this exercise that we do called the Marketplace Mission Trip, where we challenge people to go to their own job like they're an overseas missionary. And then we have an online community, which is our place. This is the way where we can connect with one another and help one another to do this better for the long haul. And you've been doing this for about five years. That's when you stood follower Correct. one up. Correct. And these... So these mission trips, right? One, mm -hmm. one venue is I'm just going to my regular job, but you've also got them set up to kind of hang out together. Is that is that right? Yeah. So the mission trip is like a class that we all take together, but we are all remote. And so um, it's like remote schooling. It's just a two-week exercise with a daily devotional and a video. And we intersperse Zoom calls in there one at the beginning and a few throughout the first week and then more the second week. And we challenge people to go to their workplace and actively pray for their coworkers, find ways to appreciate people, practice how you answer the question, why are you doing this? That's know what you believe. And then serve others, just come up with whatever idea God gives you for serving people outside of your job description. And then the fifth uh, daily activity is speak for yourself. It's about giving our testimony using I and me statements so that we're not telling other people how to live. And the mission trip is just a two-week concentrated effort of doing that. And we hope that people come away from the mission trip realizing, oh, I can keep this going. This is something that I can do as a matter of my everyday life. The person who really enjoyed this the most was a friend of mine 
who's uh, actually no longer with us, but he was he was almost retired and they had a small business. His family had a small business. And he really enjoyed the fact that that he now had a solution for how to bring his faith to work. And he was surprised at how easy it was to talk about his faith after he had done something for someone. And then they prompted the discussion by asking a question. And he was just blown away at how much fun that was and how easy it was now that he had this confidence that he could just go into the marketplace and do things for people. And the ones that then responded in some way, shape, or form, that he would get an opportunity to share with them. And he thought that was a lot of fun. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. Yeah. We've, we've um, as far as the people who are surprised, many of them, I think, are more surprised that God does stuff in the moment. One of the days of the trip, we actually challenge people to just text friends that they haven't spoken to in a long time. And there was one friend who texted a friend. He didn't even know, but that friend wasn't living near him anymore. They were a thousand miles away from him. And they texted him back almost instantly and said, I can't believe you just sent me a text. Would you please pray for us? My daughter's in the hospital. And this was during COVID and she couldn't get in to do anything to help her daughter. Well, I think that's a brilliant plan because um, my whole career has been built around uh, helping people solve problems, Yeah, making friends and helping people solve problems. And I have remarkable opportunities to talk about the gospel mm -hmm. late in the evening over dinner yes. in an ordinary conversational way, because we have that relationship. We're just talking yeah. about how we're living life. Correct. And if my faith is my everyday life and not something I just do when I can get back to the church, then it just naturally comes out. We don't even have to tell people how to do that. We just encourage them. I, the speak for yourself bullet is to use I and me statements. So I'm not telling someone else how they have to live type of thing. There's great joy in doing what I do excellently, doing my job really, really well as a fundamental Christian calling. And yet we're not giving people the encouragement that that's really something they ought to take real joy in. I mean, when I tell people you ought to have real joy in cutting the grass or washing dishes. And if you do those things, you really do experience joy mm -hmm. in a way that those things are eternally significant because that's what God made you to do. Yeah. So, so Mike, let's lean in on Raymond here and not let him have a coasting on this, you know, um, <laughs> you know, Raymond, surely, Surely someone who is in a capital intensive manufacturing industry with a bunch of uh, cowboys who are out there slinging around white hot steel and turning it into big manufacturing products. Surely there's no space for Christianity there and you just have to keep your head down and live in a foxhole, right? What, what goes on over in the steel world? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's great fun because it's a exciting thing to make things to really fulfill the creation mandate of subduing and ruling over the earth, uh, that science and technology is really the fulfillment of naming everything in God's creation. So Bernoulli's equation is a fancy name for how the world works. And, and calculus is fancy language to understand how things fit together. And software is a different kind of language in order to accomplish things and organize data. So it's fascinating. And I've been just absolutely surprised because um, one of the key things that differentiates me from almost everybody younger than me, but not older than me, is I'm always trying to treat the person as a person, learn about their family, understand how they got into the business. And so it's just an absolute natural thing. And I find out that two thirds or three quarters of the people I talk to have either a mild Christian background or a deep Christian background. Mm -hmm. It's just shocking. I was, I was at dinner last week and I'm talking to people and they ask me what I'm doing. And I tell them about the disciple dilemma thing that you're doing. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the guys says, well, my dad's a pastor and he grabs the disciple dilemma card and, and emails his dad. So I have to connect up with his dad, but that's an absolutely typical kind of thing for me. Uh, one of the guys who runs the steel program out at the Colorado School of Mines was just delighted to talk to me about the disciple dilemma and had watched a video at night when he went to bed. 
and had sent me all kinds of stuff. So it's just, uh, it's just a wonderful environment because a lot of the cultural things that you would experience in a major corporation are almost completely absent. We mm-hmm. still have a very traditional business environment where I mainly work with you because I trust you because I've developed a relationship with you. Yeah. And that gives you just an ideal platform for talking about what it means to be a Christian. I agree with Mike completely. You don't tell them that they need to do this or they need to go to church. You just say, Mike, in follower of one, you've got people who are getting together and having a conversation about who they are in Christ and then how we're all trying to think about engaging the society and the workplace and the communities that we're in. What are some of the stories you're hearing from some of the folks who have been a part of Follower of One and they've gone out into it? Both the wonder of it and the, oh my gosh, you know, the barrage fire. What have you heard? A manager recently took the mission trip and was just so excited because it gave her this new purpose for what she was doing. Her job was feeling more of a drudge. And now she's re-energized. She has a ministry to her team, to the people that she reports to, and the work that she's doing. We have a one story I kind of like to tell was a, um, a executive in a company. And in the staff meeting they had on Wednesday of the second week, uh, a project that she was very, was very near and dear to her heart was kind of attacked by a peer. But instead of responding harshly, she chose to just listen and, you know, not respond at all. And after that meeting was over, everybody kind of parted company. But later in the day, our mission trip member was in the gym and she was the only student in the yoga class. And in came the other person who kind of attacked her that day. And they had a much better conversation than she said. We had a much better conversation than we would have had I reacted the way I was typically prepared to react. Wow, what a coincidence. Those Bible principles work, huh? That's crazy. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's cool for when people experience it firsthand, because it's hard for a pastor to create a relevant explanation that makes all 800 people in the room feel at home with the illustration. Um, Many pastors specialize in running churches. That's their job. And so they don't have a lot of business or engineering or nursing or educational or government experience. And so uh, this is a way for people to make it personal. And then we try and help them get their stories in front of other people too. So they can go, oh, I can do that. You got any tough stories of people who encountered some really adverse circumstances as a result of their faith being available? Well, so we don't really have a lot of stories of people being confronted because of their faith in that two-week period, but we do experience a lot of difficulty. All the members of these mission trips, there's a lot of spiritual warfare going on during the trips. We've had um, we've had people who've had close family members pass away during a mission trip. The whole department's getting reorganized. It's kind of a joke on those of us who are doing these regularly that the two weeks of the marketplace mission trip are a real challenging time from a spiritual warfare, distraction, calendar perspective. And so that's most of what we're seeing so far. I haven't heard a lot about people being persecuted because of the mission trip itself. But one other thing we do, we actually encourage people during the two weeks of the mission trip not to share about this on social media because we don't want our peers Mm -hmm. and our coworkers and our friends and our customers to feel like they're part of some experiment or something. I think the first thing is by actively praying for people, whether they know it or not, God starts using us in their lives, even in the way that we deliver our work and that type of thing. But also the second one, appreciating people, that was kind of the last of the five daily activities that I thought of. When I'm actively engaged in appreciating people and creating eye contact and actually coming into work early so that I can get my job done ahead of schedule so that I'm available to be interrupted by other people, when I'm intentional about those things, then I'm on mission. I just have to remind myself not listen to the lies that I might be feeling through some other channel. I'm doing what God would have me do there today. This is where he's chosen for me to be. 
And I want to represent him well by finding ways to give away little pieces of my life or my resources so that other people might come to know Jesus. Folks, we're talking with Mike Henry Sr. with Follower of One, followerofone.org. And we're going to take just a short break. And when we come back, we'll let Raymond take a swing at the bat too because we're interested in the kind of stories he's seeing and how he's engaging the marketplace. Thanks for listening. We'll be right back. Folks, we're talking with Mike Henry Sr. with Follower of One. We're so grateful that the Follower of One Mafia would show up here today to talk to us about their business model and what they're doing with business folks in the marketplace. And Raymond Monroe is with us to help untangle the knots I create and help us think a little more clearly as we go along. So, Mike, just a moment ago, you were talking about the ideas that are being conversed about in Follower One when you have these mission trips, these virtual mm -hmm. mission trips. Kind of recap for us again, some of the stuff you're hearing people say and some of the things you guys are leaning in on to say, how do I do Christianity in the office, in the factory, eight to five, Monday through Friday? What'd you say? Well, what it boils down to is finding ways to serve people, to pray for them and appreciate them and let God direct us um, and finding ways to serve other people. Typically, what we do is our job. The rest of the world kind of has an explanation for that. It's the things that we do over and above what might be expected of us that help to set us apart and give us the opportunity to explain that our faith is a motive and why we live differently. Wow. Well, I mean, surely, Raymond, you see this from a completely different angle, and you want to <laughs> condemn and debate everything that Mike has said. What say you, Dr. Monroe? Oh, oh, I actually think that he's dead on. And even more important, two things. One is um, the scripture is very clear that my mission in life is to do what I'm doing the best that anybody can do it yes. to the full extent of my talent, skills, and capabilities. And that God has placed me in this time and in this place, no matter what my skills and talents are, to do the absolute best I can. So if I am a PhD and I'm supposed to unclog a toilet, I need to do the best job possible at unclogging the toilet. Yes. So really it's to be the best that I can absolutely be. And the other thing that I just, I'm an old guy, and so I'm learning things all the time. And one of the challenges I've realized is we live in a world that's impatient and who believes that things that happen to me are distractions that I need to get out of the way. And one of the biggest insights I've had to have is that every time one of those things happen, it's God's providence, and it's an opportunity for me to care about somebody and show them love and concern. And that's really hard for me because I got yeah. things I got to do <laughs> and programs I'm trying to fulfill and to step back and listen to people and try to understand who they are so that I can provide some benefit to them. But I think that is fundamentally what it means to be a Christian at work, to do my job yeah. uh, outstandingly well. And then in addition to that, to care about the people I work with. So here's Excellent. the question I want to pitch back to you guys. I I end up having a conversation like this. Of course, I'm not going to do it as eloquently as you two do it. But the response <laughs> that I get is, you got to be kidding me. You're going to act like a goody two shoes and just try to work really hard. What do you expect to have happen as a result of all that? What do you guys say about that? Well, so that kind of a response, I, I mean, it's, it's not about just working really hard. It's about doing the best that I can, committing to one thing at a time. If I'm holding something back, then... That's the degree to which I don't trust God with my time or my energy or my effort. And I'm terrible about this. There's many of my former employers, if they're listening to this podcast, they're going, I think that looks like the old Mike Henry, but yeah, I never heard this stuff before. I didn't see this <laughs> when, when he was at my place, but it's one of those things that we're always working on, right? Yeah. 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 I, I think you guys are really doing a beautiful job of illustrating the fact that um, as believers, we are to behave in a way that says, my boss is my boss, but he's not my boss. I'm working to a higher call standard effort. In other words, I'm all in with all I've got. I might not be the sharpest knife in the drawer. Maybe I am, but I'm all in on what I'm doing so that people go, why is that person living that way? Is that in a broad sense what you're saying with this, Raymond? 
Oh, I, I think that's absolutely true. Not only that, that brings you great joy. That's really the journey of life is to figure out how I can show God's love to other people. It's not how morally perfect I can be. And so one of the challenges we face is we reduce Christianity to justification and sanctification. Yeah. And by justification, we really mean that if I'm already a Christian, my only job is evangelism, really. And evangelism is incidental to being a disciple. Being a disciple means I'm supposed to show Christ's love to others. And then we talk about sanctification like it's a personal growth in holiness. So I'm supposed to become Jesus. And Jesus worked for 30 years in a small town. And when he stood up and said, I'm the Messiah, they were going to throw him off of a mountain. <laughs> so clearly he did his job well and cared about people around him, but it looked pretty ordinary. And so I think as Christians, what we do day in and day out should look ordinary, except for the deep, loving, personal relationships we have with everybody we encounter. And that's the platform with which we have to share our faith. And sharing our faith doesn't mean trying to get a conversion. We'll let the Holy Spirit work on their heart. My job is really just to show them loving Christ and to be a clear um, clear in why I do what I do and how I can help them. Okay, Mike. So fess up. You guys at Follower One are really just trying to make evangelists out of everybody, right? So actually what I'm trying to do is to help us live a life that helps people move one notch closer to Jesus. I believe evangelism is the act of people helping, helping people move the notches up before you become saved. After you trust Christ as your Savior, all those notches, I would call that discipleship or sanctification, but I just see it all as one continuum, and it doesn't matter where I am in that puzzle. It matters where the other person is, and so wherever they are, it's up to me to kind of try and discern that and help them move the next notch. And, of course, it's, 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 it's a relationship, so they okay. are teaching me all the time, even yeah. if they're new to the faith or they're not even in the faith. I will learn things about my job from them by listening, but I'll also learn things about my own failures, my own shortcomings, my own strengths from those people. So those relationships are not a one-way street where I'm investing my precious time in someone else and it's a waste yeah. of time, but I do it because I'm earning brownie points in the sky. I'm doing it because it really is who I am and what I'm supposed to do. So to yeah. me, discipleship is not about what I know, or what I do. It's about exactly. who I am. Because if you go to work and you pray for your coworkers, you're on a mission trip. There's nothing to catch up to. And um, and then people who are further on in their career, many of them already understand this. And part of what we try and challenge them to do, once they understand what we're doing, is to invite other people along. Because we all don't understand this, or it would be different. You know, many of us think that there isn't a lot for us to do in the workplace. What does the believer Raymond see with the younger believers that are in the world you circulate in that you go, boy, that's different than the way I think? Oh, um, I think the biggest shocking thing, just even between me and my children, is the move from community where I'm supposed to make a contribution to institutions that are supposed to serve me. It's really shocking because the one institution that allows people to build deep relationships because it requires sacrifice and commonality is their vocation. So the mm -hmm. biggest opportunity we have to reach the lost is in our business and workplace. Mm -hmm. And one of the biggest challenges is our religion has become one of our institutional affiliations and memberships, not who I am. Mm -hmm. It's not my identity. And so instead of saying, I'm a Christian first and foremost, and one of the biggest problems, and I know I've told you this before, Dennis, and my daughter and daughter-in-laws, when they first had kids, thought being a mother was another activity they did, not a person they were supposed to be. <laughs> And so to me, that's the biggest challenge I think we face in your, in your book is shifting the notion from discipleship from being either a theology that I understand or a set of tasks that I do to a very definition of who I am so that in every circumstance, I'm trying to advance the kingdom of God and show his love to other people. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. As we round the corner on this conversation about follower of one, um, 
Mike, I would be interested in how you see this playing out. Some <clears throat> some ministry folks say my vision is to have two million people and I'm going to monetize this thing and it's going to be just a fantastic experience out there for just a, a, a giant you know YouTube channel. Um, this sounds to me like this is an incredibly individual to individual type experience. Where, where are you pointing the dot on this thing, Mr. Founder and CEO? Well, I do hope that a lot of people join and take the marketplace mission trip and start praying for their coworkers. And if we could measure it, I would measure the success of follower of one in helping believers pray for their coworkers, because I got to believe that everything else is downstream of that. If I pray for my coworkers, then the rest of how I show up at work becomes Jesus's problem. And, uh, you know, if he wanted it done better, he'd had to chosen somebody else. But it's me in this business at this time bearing his name. So um, we we actually ask people to pay it forward. We ask people to donate so that other people can take part in what we're doing. And uh, our long term goal would be to have enough people who are regularly donating as part of their online marketplace mission and uh, that it pays the bills. And we've asked people and we have certain donors who invest in what we're doing to help us build this out. But um, our my dream is, is that marketplace Christians everywhere will be ready to minister to the people that they meet with on a daily basis and instead of the average lost person knowing zero or one Christian, if they know five or six and those people are all ready to serve these people in such a way that they might ask. And then when they ask, they can give them a reasonable story and explain the hope that is in them. That's my dream. What? How do you envision getting um, Mike Jr. or someone else <laughs> And, and expanding your ministry so that you have 10 of these sort of regional locations or that growing up? Our sure. focus is actually on the local church. We actually want to help local churches do their own marketplace mission trip using our tools and our online community and our resources, because I think you do this better if you know the other people on the trip. So you that's your scale-up up plan then, using churches as your scale-up. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, we want to, we are a partner of the local church. We want to support the local church. One day, I'd love to have dozens of churches all doing their own marketplace mission trips as a way to help their members be a little more sharp about living their faith every day in their right. own context and environment. We, we want to do the same thing with business leaders and with uh, schools and other Christian ministries and organizations. That's brilliant. The, the, you <clears throat> collaborating with the church. But one of the things I've found is the clericalism that Dennis talks mm -hmm. about really does. I'm sure you've already met resistance because mm -hmm. it's a different program. And, and of course, what they really want to do is find a mega church that's had a successful program, not recognizing that that successful program was really the local leadership that embraced it and mm -hmm. understood it and was doing it. Mm -hmm. And so they, uh, they get the materials and they do it for six months and then they go on to the next program. And your, your thing would be a more person-to-person -person empowering people that aren't um, in the full-time Christian ministry. They're not on staff. So what, why in the world would you be doing that? <laughs> we'll, we'll get them a cup of coffee. So Well, I think there are a lot of pastors who really want what we want, which is their members to be flourishing in ministry. But if they're, you know, they're, they're out of options. When, when you have enough nursery workers and you have enough of your other programs are all staffed, then what do you ask the next person to do? Well, go be the assistant to the helper in the three-year-olds. That's not, you know, that's not the, and so what we've done now is we've given them an avenue, I believe, to help, and they've had it all along. We didn't create anything. This is, this is my own kind of contortion on an, a crazy idea, but this is what Jesus called us all to do anyway. So I just want to help pastors have this mechanism. It's easy for their church to implement, and it helps their people kind of go, oh, I can do that and get into ministry again. What we're banking on is uh, trying to get pastors telling pastors and trying to get business leaders telling business leaders 
trying to get individuals telling individuals. Most of our podcasts are people who have taken the mission trip so that they can tell what it was like for them to take the mission trip as a nurse or a teacher or a business person. Ray, last pitch is from you. What do you want to talk about on this subject of digital discipleship, which is kind of what I see this being? Where, where do you want to go? Oh, I am. Um... I just I think Mike's program is just absolutely brilliant in terms of getting people to realize that being Christian in their workplace is not some odd theological, liturgical, apologetical, evangelical task. It's just being nice to the person next to me and listen when they tell me about their fishing trip mm -hmm. and volunteering to help them when they have a flat tire or their car needs to be jumped off. And so I just think that's absolutely brilliant and what it means to be a disciple. And so to me, I think the one thing that he could do is be more explicit as he has been with us, that discipleship and living for Christ is just really being Christian in the way you treat other people yeah. in love and service. So you get the last word. And in that last word, would you also talk to us a little bit about how we connect with follower of one and what we can expect on the ride if we do? Absolutely. My prayer is that, that we're paying attention to the people around us and we're listening to Jesus when he tells us to do something so that they might know him better. And uh, any way that we can help you do that, one person at a time, one interaction at a time, one moment at a time, we want to do that. That's our goal and follower of one. And everything we do has been set up that way. You can go to followeroforone.org and connect with us there. Our online community is community.followerofone.org, and you can request to be a member there, and there's no charge, and just start doing this stuff, and who knows what happens after you start, and so I'm excited to see what God does with all of this. Thank you very much for having me on here. It's been a blessing. Oh, we're delighted you've been with us, right, Ray? Oh, absolutely. Ray, thanks for being with us today and helping sure. us make some mileage out of this thing. <laughs> yeah. Folks, you've been listening to Mike Henry Sr., who is the founder and CEO of Follower of One. Mike is coming to us from Tulsa. Raymond Monroe with us again from Chicago, and I'm coming from the center of the universe, Washington, D.C., <laughs> or not. And we have enjoyed having Mike, you, with us on Follower of One. I hope, everybody, you'll take a few minutes to check out followerofone.org, one spelled O-N-E, not the number one, followerofone.org, so you can see this ministry, which is a very, very practical experience for discipleship in our vocational world, in our communities that we live in. Help us get the word out that discipleship's been hacked. We need your help leveraging the digital marketplace. Uh, check us out at discipledilemma.com, that's our website. On Facebook, we're at The Disciple Dilemma. On Instagram, The Disciple Dilemma. And on YouTube, The Disciple Dilemma. And you can see what we have to offer talking about this hack that's undermining discipleship against the model that Jesus gave us. And this hack has some interesting tentacles to it. Mike has taken us down a journey today of untangling some of those tentacles in the marketplace. Folks, as always, thanks for listening.